So after searching the depths of YouTube and being bored, I decided I wanted to make a steam cache. My neighbor had a bunch of PCs in his garage, so I decided to take one and see if I could set it up. The PC had about 8 gigs of DDR3 RAM, two one terabyte hard drives, some sort of graphics card and some old processor on but I decided it would fit the job well and said why not, let's just do it. So what is a Steam Cache? First off, a normal Steam download, you would go over, download the game, your computer would connect to the Steam server in New York or Boston, wherever, and it would download the file from the server to your computer through the internet. The Steam Cache behaves differently in that it is a middleman in between the connection between the Steam server and you. First, your computer connects to that system and it asks, Hey, do you have these files that I need? The cache will say, No, and then forward it to Steam or website or whatever. So let's just say you're downloading, I don't know, Counter-Strike. Simple game. Your computer would then connect to the Steam cache and ask, Do you have this file that I need for Counter-Strike? The computer may say no or yes. If it says no, it's going to connect to Steam, get the file, download the file onto that machine, and then forward it over to your actual machine. So, the next time you download that game, it'll connect to the Steam cache, which will be, which will say, oh, I actually, I already have that file, and then send it directly to your computer. As a result of this, you can experience much faster download time if it's on the same network, which is what more often what it's used for. Depending on your computer specs, you can hit around 60 megabytes per second all the way up to 400, 500 megabytes per second, even up to a gigabyte in some instances. The system that I have now with just simple hard drives, 8 gigs DDR3, won't really download as fast as a huge high-end system, but it will do the trick. So a good use for this would be for LANs. If you have a LAN with 40 people on one network and a patch comes out or everyone wants to download some popular game, they don't have to wait for everyone else to download it as well and deal with bandwidth and everything. Or, let's just say you are a bunch of friends come over and they go they go and want to download this new game or whatever. Or let's just say you have multiple people that play games on the same network and play the same exact games that you play. This would be useful. I noticed that however for one person it's literally the same thing as had, having a second hard drive. So if it's just you, I don't recommend it. But if you have a couple of brothers or sisters, whoever, then I do recommend it. So without further ado, I guess we'll get started. So we're actually going to be running this in Ubuntu Desktop. Apparently Docker has some issues with Windows if you're using the Home Edition, not the Pro Edition. And it's also just easier to set up in Ubuntu anyways. I'm not going to be using the server because that is complicated. So we're just going to go with the classic UI and click download. This will begin downloading an ISO file, which is about 1.8 gigs, so it might take a bit. While that downloads, I would check out Rufus. Rufus is a utility that allows you to mount an ISO onto a flash drive to go out a computer to boot from it. So it's only one megabyte, it's free. So just click Rufus 3.3 Portable and it should download. When it is done downloading, open it up. So Rufus should be pretty simple to set up. First thing you're gonna wanna do is select your device, your flash drive, make sure that's plugged in the computer and select it over here. Over here, you're going to want to click select and then choose your the disk image that you just downloaded. Over here, you can leave these the same. You can change the name of the flash drive if you want. All of this could stay the same, and then you just click start. Right in ISO image mode, it may ask you to download something. Just click yes, and it should just download, and then you'll come to this. Click OK, and then... Once you have made sure that there is nothing on that flash drive, click OK. Please note, this will delete everything on the flash drive, so make sure that you're using one that you do not need. I'm not going to be clicking OK because I actually need that flash drive, and that has stuff on it, like another Ubuntu install. So, once you click OK, this green bar is going to start filling up, and eventually when it's done, it'll say ready, and then you could close out. Rufus, take out your flash drive and boot it up. So here we are on the Ubuntu installer. I'm actually running this in a virtual machine right now. 
because I am too poor for a gra capture card and I have no other way to record this efficiently, so ignore this trash tool. It'll be rather basic. First, we're going to click install Mbutu, then just select your keyboard layout, hit continue. Uh, I'm going to select minimal installation because we don't need all the office software, utilities, solitaire, etc. And I guess download updates while installing Ubuntu. Continue. So over here you can dual boot Ubuntu. However, I would rather just install it and I believe that would be the most optimal solution because you need the most, as much space as possible. Caches do take up a lot of space, so... I'm going to erase disk and install Ubuntu. Again, please note, this will delete everything on the hard drive that you have currently, so make sure you don't have anything important like your homework or a book report or the nuclear codes. So click continue. And this should be pretty simple, just who you are and your time zone. I recommend calling your computer like Steam Cache or whatnot. Not really required, but it'll, it's still good to have. And I'm gonna log in automatically. And it should begin installing. Now you just gotta wait, do that homework you were putting off, go outside, make a coffee, whatever. It should finish up in about 10 minutes. So I guess I will be back when it does. So once Ubuntu is done installing, you'll see this. Just simply click restart now. Once your computer once the computer is fully shut down, unplug the flash drive and it should boot into Ubuntu. Okay, so here's the fun part. Hopefully all this recording stuff is set up correctly. I've actually never run OBS before on a Linux. So earlier I actually tried, this doesn't have the .mp4 reader on here. So I had to plug it into my actual PC and then I got all panicky because the audio wasn't working. Then I realized I never plugged in my headphones. So that was great. So I guess we'll get started on actually installing and running Docker. So, right click, open terminal. So once Ubuntu's terminal is open, this is where we're going to be doing most of the work. So enjoy it. First, we type, we need to install curl. And you can do this by typing sudo. In case you don't know, sudo is what allows a command to run as administrator. sudo apt install curl dash y and enter type in your password okay so now that curl has finished installing we can actually use it to install docker so sudo curl dash ssl make sure that caps are capped https dot slash dash get dot docker dot com slash pipe this is above the enter key if you hold shift and sh. Enter. Alright, you can actually ignore that warning. That thing is always there. So, now that Docker is actually installed, we can make sure that it is running by doing sudo systemctl status docker. Do you see the term? active and running in green, you have done everything correctly so far. Congratulations. Shift Z twice in order to go back to the terminal. Now we need to start messing with IPs. So in case you don't know, every single device that connects your router has its own local IP. This local IP can be used to communicate between devices across the local network. The local IP usually follows a syntax of 192.168.1.x or 192.168.0.x depending on your router. So we can actually check on this local machine's IP if we type hostname i and it is the first one, so 192.168.1.46. Be sure to remember this because we will be using this a lot. Now we need to do some setup messing around with the IP, so sudo ntmui, that's not it, sudo nmtui, there we go. And you should get this pink screen, or purple, might be purple. Over here we're going to want to hit enter to edit a connection. Right, edit wired connection 1. Over here IPv4 config, we're going to want to select manual, and then show. Address, we're going to want to type in that address from earlier, so 192.168.1.46. For the gateway, we need to type in our router's gateway. So in order to get your default gateway, 
you can go to your actual PC, go to CMD, and type ipconfig. Over here where it says default gateway, this is what you would enter. Here. So once you actually get your default gateway, you just enter it in here, under gateway, and that's all we need. For DNS servers, we're going to add 1, 1.1.1.1, 1 .1 .1 .1 .1, and we will add 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Hey, I'm coming from the future because I forgot to say this. While write, After writing the address, type slash 32. And that is all we really need to do over here. So, just go down all the way to OK, then back, then quit. So if we do hostname dash i again, we should see the 192.1.46. So in order to actually figure out whether or not your computer can access the cache, you can open up CMD and then type ping and then that local IP. So 192.168.1.46 and you should start seeing replies. Sent for receive for lost zero. Great, we have done it correctly. Oh. I actually put the code inside, or the command inside a note text document because it is easier to manage that way. This would be in the description, so don't worry. So all you really need to do here is just restart, reset, change username to your actual profile username, both instances. And also change this IP to the IP that we set earlier. So the, in this case, it would be dot forty six. If you don't know what your username is, then you could actually look over here next to the at. Figure it out that way. Then select all, copy. Go back into terminal, right click, paste, and then enter. Okay. So you wouldn't just get that. Um, you would normally get a whole bunch of pull requests, downloading, installing, etc. And it would take much longer than that. I actually tried this before and got an error because I entered something wrong. So that's why it just instantly started running. So we actually need to do this one more time with another command. So here's another command that you can get from the description. This, all we need to do is just change the IPs to the local IP that we found earlier. So in this case, it is dot .46, and over here, dot .46, and that is actually all we need to do with this one. So again, just copy terminal and paste it, then hit enter. Now we'll start downloading from the web, and it has extracted, and it, it should be running. To check whether or not this is all running, sudo docker container ls and you should see two containers up 16 seconds up two minutes whatever and they should be running on the ports that is your local ip and it matches we need to do one more thing on the client before we can start downloading things, we need to tell it to connect to the Ubuntu server first before trying to down something from scene. How this works is it usually asks Ubuntu, hey, do you have this? The computer goes no, and then it will forward it to the actual website if you're just going to YouTube or whatnot. But if you go downloading from Steam, the cache will go, oh, hold on, let me download it, I'll forward it to you. Or, it'll go, hey, I already have this downloaded, I'll send it right over to you, and you don't have to go to the Steam server in Boston or New York or whatever. So, in order to start doing this, we're going to open up Control Panel. We go to Network and Sound. Network Sharing Sensor. Change Adapter Settings. Right-click on your current Internet Adapter. Then, go to Internet Protocol version 4. Click Properties. Over here, Use the following DNS server addresses, and that IP is back. So, 192.168.1.46. I did not mean to hit 7. As for alternate DNS server, just do 1.1.1. And then hit OK. Then close. Then close. Then close. 
Okay, so now we actually have to install a game. I have the cache folder open on the Ubuntu machine right next to me. And if I want, I can actually go to the system monitor. There it is. Go to resources, and then at the bottom, you can actually see your network history. So right now, it is sending zero bytes per second. And it's receiving 147 bytes per second, which might as well just be background processes. But once we click next, notice that the cache actually starts spiking to 9 megabytes per second, 11 megabytes per second, 8 megabytes per second, etc. And the CPU starts actually running things. We get about 7 megabytes per second peak, and forwarding it on the machine makes it go to. 6 megabytes per second peak, so I guess this does lose some performance depending on how good your PC is, but now we have this downloaded, we should be able to play it, and if we uninstall it, it'll still be on the cache. The cache went down to 0 bytes per second, and if we click install, next, go to downloads, it should spike drastically. Yep, 49 megabytes, 40. Depending on your system, this will be higher. If you see it go down to zero bytes per second, that's more your hard drive extracting files and putting it on the disk versus the internet failing. So don't be alarmed when that happens. And we are done. All the files have been sent over to this computer and it is playable. Okay, well, that's about it. I would like to thank you all for sticking around, and because I don't have an outro, I guess I will see you next time. Yeet.